Thank you for tuning in to Warren Martin Ministries. I'm so excited that you tuned in today. I want you to know that this is a power-packed broadcast where the Lord is going to release his miracles, his signs, his wonders, and the revelation of his word. So I want you to fasten your seatbelts, and we'll see you on the other side. We'll be right back. I'm married. I'm separated. I'm engaged. I'm a widow. I'm single. I'm divorced. I'm looking. Miracle Temple of Christ for people like you. Church isn't for perfect people. It's for those who know what it's like to fall and get back up again. People who realize that there's no such thing as a perfect person. I'm Pastor Warren of Miracle Temple of Christ, and we're here for people like you. We're going to begin to delve into all what God has placed within uh, our hearts and our lives so that that way can be active. Amen. And I'm learning as I walk with the Lord that God not only moves in seasons, not that we are uh, controlled by seasons, but he moves in ways concerning time. And when God is moving, we have to respond to his movement. Amen? How many of you understand that you have to respond to his movement? Amen. And the way we interpret how God moves, we call it seasons. Uh, and one of the defining ways as we can understand that we are alive and how the world is to moving and time is going forward one of the identifying factors is seasons. It get cold, it get warm, it get sunny, it get gloomy, snow is on the ground, it rains a lot. So we, as humans, we identify time by seasons. Amen. So I want to show you something because this is extremely important today. Today we're going to talk about the key of obedience. Now let's look at that because I want you to get that in your spirit. The key of obedience. Amen. So the first scripture, let's go to the book of Romans, chapter 6, verse 17. The book of Romans, chapter 6, verse 17. And then I'm going to let you take your seats after this. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered unto you. Amen. A proper exegesis of the scripture will say, praise be to God, that you were once servants of sin, but you now obey from the heart the form of righteousness which is delivered unto you. So you were once a slave to sin, now you become a slave to righteousness. Amen. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word and sanctify deep within our hearts. You know what to do. Give you an enable, a high five. Let them know once again it's on. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. <clears throat> amen. If you just give me 20, 20 good minutes, amen, I promise you're going to go somewhere. Amen. Very important. So we look at this. Write this down. Obedience is the essence of faith. Amen. I love this to think that obedience is the flavor of faith. <laughs> obedience is the core of faith amen because faith without works is dead faith without actions is nothing it's just talk so eventually your faith has to do something amen and amen are you understanding that but god be thanked so the apostle is talking about praising god that you were once servants of sin we were once obedient to sin we were faithful to sin. We were faithful to unrighteousness. But you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered unto you. So now, as a result of the gospel of Jesus Christ, you now become a slave or obedient to righteousness. That's all that means right there. Amen, someone. Amen. Mark chapter 11, verse 23. Amen. And I want to go back to the seasons, the reason why I mentioned this. Jesus Christ said, for verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart, but you shall believe that those things which he say unto you or which he saith shall come to pass. You shall have whatsoever he says. Or whatever you say. 
Amen. So if you can believe God through his word, now you are able to emulate speaking by way of his word into your life, into your situation, and things line up. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Amen. It is as a parent, it is a contradiction for you to tell them to do what you don't do. Are you understanding what I'm saying? So heaven begins to obey you when you obey God. It's that same, it's that same understanding. Whatsoever you bind on earth is bound in heaven or earth and, and in heaven. Whatsoever you loose on earth is also loosed in heaven. So therefore, when you begin to operate in this realm, this supernatural realm, it's because you have made yourself in this earth obey the word. And then for truly I say unto you, whatsoever you say unto this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that these things which you say shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever you say. Let this month, the end of this month, these last two weeks be whatever you say. So as you know, for the, for the first couple of weeks of this month, we've been teaching about the kings, uh, the keys to the kingdom and the more that I'm learning and walking with the Lord, the more that I experience this or ups and downs, trials, tribulations, success, failures, whatever life brings me, the more that I deal with it, the more that I'm learning to know God. And I'm also finding out, and this is amazing, you're going to love this, that the Lord operates not only day by day, not only week by week, but he also operates month to month. Mm, this bless me. First of all, for verily I say unto you that whatsoever you shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be cast into the sea, and you shall not doubt in your heart, but you shall believe that those things which he says shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he says. Hold on. How can I expect a mountain to obey me if I don't obey God? This is why many mountains remain. Why should a mountain obey you? Why should a trial obey you? If we don't obey God's word. So heaven mimics what we do. And it's a cyclical issue. We mimic, heaven mimics what we do, but we mimic what God's word is already settled in heaven. So whatever we mimic, God's word, heaven does the same in our earth. And it constantly goes around. Now, I want to show you something because this is amazing. Not only does God move from day to day, from week to week, but he also moves from month to month. This is why you notice trials and tribulations happen from month to month. Success happens from month to month. This is why you'll have a good month in your relationship. And the next month is crazy. You understand what I'm saying? It's from month to month. So we have to understand how the enemy has leeway. Amen. And the reason why trials and tribulations come is because we have not proclaimed over the month. God's word. Are you understand what I'm saying? Amen. When Jesus Christ said, he said, you ought to pray this way. Our father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy word, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What else does he say? Give us this day our daily bread. What else? Forgive us our trespasses. What else? And forgive those who trespass against us. What else? Lead us not into temptation, but what? But deliver us from evil. What else? For thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory, forever. Amen. Now, so he's saying, bring your will into my now. Do do you understand what I'm saying? This is why we're not supposed to worry about tomorrow because tomorrow is sufficient for itself and the evils thereof. So we have to make sure that we speak over our days, speak over our weeks, And speak over our months. Let me show you something. The Revelation chapter 22, verse 2. Watch this. This blessed me. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare 12 manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every when? Uh Uh-oh. Yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nation. So 12 fruit. Watch this, in the tree of life, and yielded her fruit every month. Watch this. The fruit that's yielded the following month is 
the seeds of the preceding month what has been spoken. They are the seeds that we have planted the previous month. So if you went crazy and did not worship God, expect the crazy month following. If you have not spoken into your now, when you speak into your now, you're also speaking into your future. Because the tree of life, even in heaven, do you understand what I'm saying? It has 12 manners of fruit and it gives the fruit and the harvest every single month. So in preparation for a better life and a successful life, you prepare for it today. Your tomorrow starts today. (laughs) You, You just can't walk into your tomorrow and expect, amen, not to receive a harvest from the seeds that you planted yesterday. This is why many of us are blessed, but we're still reaping the consequences from yesterday. It doesn't mean that you're not blessed, but you're still living this, the consequences from yesterday. So your prayer has to be, Lord, let me outlive my consequences from yesterday. Let me outlive the consequences of my past. Let me outlive the curses that I spoke out of my own mouth. Let me outlive, amen, someone, the sin from my own body. Let me outlive every proclamation and every demonic influence that I experienced in my yesterday. Let it not be in my today. Someone throw your hands up and pray that prayer for the Lord. That the Lord will remove the consequences from your yesterday out of your today. Hallelujah. And when I seen this, it blew my mind. Because you notice that sometimes your months, amen, if you really look at it, you look at what you deal with, it's really on a month-to-month basis. Amen, someone. So we have to understand this. In the midst of the street of it, on either side of the river, was there the tree of life which bare 12 manner of fruit and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves that the tree were the healing of the nations. Throw your hands up and say, Lord, this will be the, one of the best months of my life. Hallelujah. Lord, this will be one of the best months of my life. I don't care what you have to face. I don't care what you're dealing with. Proclaim out of your mouth that this will be the beginning of my, the best life ever. This will be the beginning of my best life ever. This month will be the beginning of every good month thereafter. Hallelujah. I don't know who I'm speaking to. This month will be the beginning of the best of the rest of my life. Hallelujah. Amen, someone. Someone throw their hands up and say enough is enough. Hey, enough is enough. Enough is enough. Amen. And I need to talk to some people that you've been arguing with your spouse. It goes from month to month. Do you understand what I'm saying? That's why you can have a good week and then a bad week. But if you look at it, it's all inclusive of the month. So the seeds that you speak, amen, someone, are the seeds that you reap. Let me repeat that. The seeds that you speak are the seeds that you reap. Are you understanding what I'm saying? And this thing really blessed me. This is why we must learn to become consistent in doing what's right until you receive a harvest from what's right. Many of us have to become disciplined in doing what's right so that that way we can learn to outlive what we've done wrong. It's not that it's not working. It's just that you, your harvest and the consequences of what you've done wrong is so much. That you just haven't caught up to it yet. Throw your hands up and say, I will, hallelujah. I will experience the joy of the Lord in the land of the living. Yes, you will. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So when you find that that trial is still lasting and you're like, what's going on? It's only because you are still outlasting and outliving and learning to outlive the consequences from yesterday. And sometimes, someone say, go Holy Ghost. Sometimes you're connected to a person still reaping the harvest from their consequences. So many of your trouble is not your trouble, it's just that who you're connected to. So this is why if you know you need to be connected to them and God assigned you to be connected to them, you say, Lord, praise God. Lord, allow their consequences not affect my tomorrow. And bless them so that their consequences, hallelujah, will be eradicated because of the grace on my life. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. This is why whatever you speak to this mountain, it shall be moved. 
You can even cause someone's consequences to be avoided by saying, Lord, I believe that upon the grace upon my life, if you remove the mountain from their life, you'll save their life. You'll save their soul. You'll bless and heal them. You have the ability to speak these things. See, we're talking about the keys of obedience, and this is not the type of message that we don't hear enough of. Amen. Because these type of messages are the types of messages that really don't agree with our own principles. They don't agree with our emotions. Amen, someone. So it's every month. Every month. Every month. This is why if you have a doctor's date in that month, you contemplate about that doctor's appointment all month. Because you are expecting or anticipating bad news from the report. So it's from month to month. Mm-hmm. The tree of life which bear 12 manner of fruit. Mm-hmm. So this month, you have to know that you are bearing a manner of fruit specific to the, to the word you spoke last month. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Or what you've dealt with in the past? Good stuff. So the Bible declares in Deuteronomy chapter 28, look at this. I want to show you something because this is amazing. Every blessing in life answers to the believer's obedience. Let me repeat that. Every blessing in life answers to the believer's obedience. Man, that's some heavy stuff. Let me repeat that one more time. Every blessing in life answers to the believer's obedience. Look at this. Read Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 1 and 2. And it shall come to pass, if you shall hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord and observe to do all his commandments. That's obedience. That whole phrase there. And it shall come to pass that if thou dost hearken, Listen, adhere, and diligently commit. Observe means to do. Amen, someone. Listen to the voice of the Lord thy God and observe and to do all his commandments. Not some, not the ones you like, not the ones that you favor or prefer. All his commandments, which I command to thee this day. Watch this. That the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations on the earth. Now watch this. Look at this in verse 2. And all these what? And all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake you if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord. Watch this. Someone say break it down Holy Ghost. And all these blessings shall come on you and overtake you. You know when you're blessed when your blessing will change your agenda. What that means is overtaking you. That means that blessings, the blessings that God will bring on you will be so many and so frequent and so abundant that it will change your whole, your whole outlook on life. They will overtake you. That means overtake your mindset. Amen, someone. I love a book that T.D. Jakes wrote years ago. He said, can you stand to be blessed? He, that means in a point of his life, he became so blessed that it completely changed his outlook that he had to write a book. <laughs> Throw your hands up and say, Lord, that's going to happen to me. That you're going to not prophesy by the power of Christ that through the obedience to God, your obedience to God, that you will become so blessed that it will overtake your agenda. See, because when your agenda is overtaken, your attitude changes. <laughs> Amen. Your mood changes. Your motives change. Your goals change when you're overtaken. And all, the, and all these blessings show come upon thee. So it's not enough just to have blessings on you. Because to have blessings on you, you still can be crazy. I've been that way. To be blessed and still crazy. <laughs> to be blessed and still have my own motives and my own agenda. But when blessings overtake you, you become, amen, like the blessor who has blessed you. 
So when blessings overtake you, it overtakes your mindset. Have you ever been in a situation where you know you should be punished, but God bless you? It changes your agenda. Lord, I should have been judged, but you blessed me. Lord, let me go on and serve you. Amen, someone. You've forgiven me when I should not have been forgiven. So, Lord, let me go ahead and bless you. Amen, someone. When the woman was caught in adultery and they all wanted to kill her, she, listen, she was going to die that day. They all had their stones. Jesus bent down on the ground and began to scribble on the ground. He said, he who is without sin, cast this first stone. He said, daughter, thy sins are forgiven thee. Go and sin no more. Do you think she went and sinned again? At least not that sin. That's when the blessings overtake you. Overtaking blessings are blessings of grace and mercy. Overtaking blessings, amen, someone, are blessings that are only associated with obedience. He said, go and sin no more. She got up and left. That's our reason why we don't see enough miracles. Because miracles are directly associated with obedience. Are you understanding what I'm saying? And I find that there are not enough miracles, even though the world needs a miracle. But if you find we're living in a world that's disobedient and disrespectful. So a world that's disrespectful in need of of a miracle is always a world that resents authority. And miracles is, listen, can I say go there? Someone say go there, Holy Spirit. Miracles are only the result of authority and the submission of it. The only reason why God will do a miracle is so you can submit to authority. So you can know that he's in control. A disrespectful person cannot afford a miracle. A disobedient person will not qualify for a miracle. Because obedience is about authority. Do you understand what I'm saying? So when the enemy, amen, someone, has you disrespectful, or when an enemy has you disobedient, he has you operating in the sin of witchcraft, the sin of rebellion, so that that way you, as a child of God, cannot experience the miracle-working power of God is a direct rebellion concerning the kingdom. So when we disobey God, we are out of order, out of the realm of his order. So therefore, miracles cannot overtake us. Blessings cannot overtake us because we are disrespectful or rebellious. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Throw your hands up and say, go Holy Spirit. Someone say, Lord, I need this. Amen. You thought miracles is about prayer and faith only. It's not just about prayer and faith. It's not just about fasting. It's also about obedience. Amen, someone. And I'm, and I'm going to go there and I'm going to step out on the limb and walk on a tightrope with me. Amen. If you want to come out there with me, there's room. Obedience is preferred above all of that. Mm, mm, mm. I understand that. Amen, someone. Because someone can be obedient and not have a prayer life and God will favor them. God will call them honorable. But, but, watch this, conversely, you can have a prayer life and be disobedient. And God not prefer you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Yeah, you prayed every day. This is why it has nothing to do with praying to the east or praying this way. And I'm not disrespecting. I'm saying it has nothing to do with those activities. It has everything to do with obedience. Because obedience is submission to authority. You have many Christians that speak in tongues all day. I had, amen, someone. I've known people that were speaking tongues. Amen. I've known women that are speaking tongues. And after we're done, wouldn't even care about my wedding ring. So it has nothing to do with those activities. It has everything to do with obedience. Because obedience, amen, someone, will make you remember your covenant. It's quiet. It's quiet. See, because this right now removes the religious behaviors. Because people think that they can do church or do God and expect God to do them. But that's not the case. Amen. Miracles is connected to obedience. And all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee. If thou hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God. Look at this. And all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake you. 
Can I say this? Someone say, go Holy Spirit. The blessings come on. See, you can have blessings and still not have the mindset of the blesser. But when the blessings overtake you, they overtake your mindset. See, (laughs) blessings don't mean anything until you get the mindset of the person that blessed you. Mm -hmm. Once we begin to change our heart, that's when the blessing meant something. Mm -hmm. Because the blessings can come on you and you can still be ungrateful. You can still be a complainer. I know what I'm talking about. You can be as blessed as they come and still be a complainer. You can be as blessed as they come, amen, someone, and still be ungrateful. But when the blessings overtake you, you have taken on the mindset of the blessor. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'll give you an example. Uh, My mother and father would always, especially my dad, would always fix us food more than we can eat. You understand what I'm saying? Amen. And one of the worst beatings I can remember... (laughs) was when I didn't eat all of the food and I hit a hot dog under the radiator. Sure enough, my dad comes in and sweeps the kitchen and the hot dog come rolling from under the radiator. And my brother and my sister bailed themselves out by pointing at me. They said it was his hot dog, he did it. And... One of the reasons why I got a whooping, I thought that I received a whooping was because he found the hot dog. And I really didn't understand that until I became older to recognize the reason why I got a whooping was because I was ungrateful. There's no greater chastisement you can receive from God until you become ungrateful. It's not about not wanting the hot dog because I could have easily said, I don't want this. I'm full. But it was being ungrateful. You understand what I'm saying? So when you are ungrateful, you remove yourself from grace. All right, let me move on. Are you understanding what I'm saying? So look at this. I want to show you something. In Isaiah chapter 119, look at this. And I only have about 10 more minutes. I promised you 20. Amen. 19, if you be willing, 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 if you be willing, if it's your will, and be obedient, what would you do? You shall eat the good of the land. How simple is that? We have made obedience so hard because obedience goes against our pride. It goes against our makeup. It goes against our logic. It goes against our respect for authority. Are you understand what I'm saying? Amen, someone. Amen. Now, watch this. Let me tell you something. Someone asked the question, amen, where does doubt come from? Doubt comes from, amen, doubt comes from not being able to believe the authoritator of which you should believe in. Doubt is nothing but disrespect disguised by I don't understand. That's all it is. That's all doubt is. Doubt is just really disrespect. Amen, someone. Doubt. Amen, someone. When the father had the son, the demonic, demonic son, he said, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. I believe. Help my resentment of authority. Help me. Because I had to make decisions on my own. I had to grow up without an authoritative figure. I had to grow up without a father. I had to grow up this. I had to grow up that. And it's made me who I am. Help my unbelief. Because I trusted and I was wounded. Because I believed and I was molested. I believed and I was taken advantage of. I believed and I was beat up. I believed and I was abused. I believed. Help my unbelief. My unbelief is my, all my disrespect. The reason why we don't believe God like we should is because we don't trust his authority. That's why the Lord says, vengeance is mine. Revenge is mine. I'll get them back. But because you don't believe my justice, because you don't believe in my judgment, you put things in your own hands. So he said, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Relax, I got this. It seemed like they're having fun. It seemed like they're getting away. But can you believe me enough? Can you trust me enough to know that when I get a hold of someone, 
So unbelief is nothing but disrespect in disguise. So I was like, Lord, forgive me, Lord. Because we never looked at it like that. We thought that the belief has to be that someone has to convince me. (laughs) And I don't believe because I'm just not convinced. No, you don't believe because disrespect is in you. Amen. Do you realize no one even needs to preach to you to know that there's a God? You can see the, amen, you can see the trees and how they bloom. You can see how a baby develops in a mother's womb. Yeah, you know how about the trimesters, but how? Yeah, you know how, but how? Amen, someone. How God keeps gravity. You keep your feet on the ground. But you're able to inhale and exhale instinctively without thinking about it. You know how, but how? Mm-hmm. So don't play that game with me. I don't believe that there's a God. Don't play that game. Because as soon as you have a near car accident, the first name you mention is Jesus. Yeah, because even if your mouth wouldn't, your soul said it. Because your spirit acknowledges that there's God. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. If you be willing and obedient. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. Throw your hands up and tell the Lord something. If you be willing and obedient. Uh Uh-huh. When Jesus Christ was in the garden of Gethsemane. Amen. And the Bible says that even his sweat appears as droplets of blood. Amen. Right before he was to be crucified. He said, Lord, if it will, if it be that this cup can pass by me, let it be. He said, but nevertheless, not my will, but let you, your will be done. Uh Uh-huh. So you can ask for God's will and you can be willing for his will and still at the end of the day, disobey. Lord, bless me to get out of this and then God bless you to get out of it and then you go ahead and disobey. So he said, if you be willing and obedient. Uh huh. See, because you can't be just willing because of an emotional breakdown. You just can't be willing because you got your heart broke. You just can't be willing because you need some financial blessing. If you're willing and obedient, mm-hmm, you'll eat the good of the land. Tell your neighbor, read that scripture. If you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. Minister Crystal almost made me run around here. The book of Acts chapter 5, verse 32. And we are his witnesses of these things. Hold on, hold on, hold on. If God has done anything, raise raise your hand if God has done anything in your life. So now you're witnesses of these things. The fact that you're bore witness of his hand should make you become more obedient. See, it doesn't make you more doubtful. Well, he did this, but this is kind of big. I don't know about that. No, no, no. You just became disrespectful. Because you witnessed what he has done. So that should make you more obedient. And we are his witnesses of these things. And so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God has given to them that obey him. Amen. And and let, let me tell you something. Let's make ourselves a lie. Because even though we saw it, the Holy Ghost saw it too. He saw you get your blessing. He helped you get your breakthrough. And now he's watching the same disobedience whom God has given to them that obey. Some good stuff. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22. I go to church and, you know, I'm, I pay my tithes. I pay my offering. Please, how much are they asking? Listen to what prophet Samuel said in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22. And Samuel said, hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Your obedience should be first. Everything else should be secondary. You can't pay or replace obedience. Amen, someone. Because some people try to buy their way into heaven. The Bible says your money perish with you. The apostle said for for thinking that you can buy the gift of salvation. Amen, someone. You can't pay this thing. You can't impress this thing. So what? I know the preacher and I've been going to church 15 years. So what? 
Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, it's better. Watch this. Behold, to obey is better. Mm. Because obedience makes you give up a little bit of yourself. Every time you obey, you lose a little bit of yourself. And you become more like him. As to obey is better than sacrifice. And to hearken than the fat of rams. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. Amen. And to hearken than the fat of the rams. Amen. So on. Every time you obey, you're going against your own principle. You're going against your own analogies. You're going against your own feelings. You're going against your own desires whenever you obey. Amen, someone. Amen, someone. The Bible says, and the Lord, the Lord said, uh, the, the, the man of God said to concerning husbands that they ought to love their wife as Christ loved the church and so died for it. So whenever a husband makes a decision for his wife, for the betterment of his wife, he dies a little bit of himself. And we as men, we feel ourselves dying like, oh, Lord. I, this decision made me die. I died a little bit. Buying you this new car, I died a little bit. You, you follow what I'm saying? Amen. Cuddling with you helped me die a little bit. Especially when the football games is on. Amen, someone. Amen. Last, last Sunday, my wife said after we were home from church, and she said the Eagles, they don't play until 4, 4, 15 this afternoon. So we have time to watch a movie in between. I felt like I died a little bit. Just right there, I looked at her, and I just felt a little bit of life. Not a lot, just a little bit of life. Left me as we watched that movie. You, you, you follow what I'm saying? Amen. Because the word of God rang out in my spirit to love our wives are so are like the way Christ loved the church and so died for it. And we don't have to die for our wives. We live for them. You follow what I'm saying? We live for them, but we love them as Christ loved the church. Amen, someone. The Bible says, honor your own husbands. Submit to your own husband. So as a wife, being so smart and so intellectual and having so many wonderful and powerful and great and earth-shattering ideas, when you have to yield to your husband, I know you die a little bit. Okay, all right, we'll do it your way. Stop slamming those doors. <laughs> Watch your attitude. I saw you walk away a little hard. I don't know. You die a little bit. Because the more you obey, the more you become like God. Amen, someone. The Bible says we have to speak to one another in hymns and psalms and in praise. Amen. Well, you want to argue, now I got to speak nice to you and smile. I'm dying a little bit. And I'm not saying that this begrudgingly. I'm saying that even with your coworker, being able to develop yourself to dwell with them in unity makes you die a little bit. Where you have principle to argue and win. This could be the first argument that you know you will have an expected win. And the Lord said, hold your peace. You're like, Lord, hold up. Wait, this is a win. I don't come. Amen, someone. Uh, uh, last week, my wife said that I was right. I said, excuse me, can you repeat that again? In front of everyone, I put my arrow. She said, all right, yeah, you're right. I said, thank you, Lord. But the point is, is being able to dwell with them, amen, in unity. To dwell together in unity. That's not just in our own household. It's not just with people that we love. It's not just in our familial environment, but also in our community. Amen, someone. Stop being so argumentative. Amen. Stop being so, so, I tear this block out. We know. We already know. We already saw you in action before back in 1973. The Bible says all things become new. Amen, someone. So obedience make us become new. So behold, to obey is better. Tell your neighbor, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. Tell them, take the key of obedience and be quiet. Don't get, don't get soft on them. Tell them, take the key of obedience and be quiet. 
all that fussing and complaining and arguing. Take the key of obedience and be quiet. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Amen, someone. Are you hearing what I'm saying? A man disrespects you and now your old self said, man, just punch him in the jaw. Take the key of obedience and shut up. Hey, you know what, brother? God, man, have a good day. God bless you, man. I'm not like that anymore. What you mean you ain't like that no more? You, you a punk. Yeah, all right, I'll be all of that. Guess right. Get in your nice car and go home. Eat a sandwich and thank God for it. Make it like you like it with mayonnaise and say, Lord, I almost got into a fight today, but thank you. I ate the key of obedience. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Amen, someone. Be the nicest, be the nicest employee ever. Amen. Be the nicest. And listen, and get your paycheck and go home and spend it. It ain't personal. Just use the key of obedience. Absolutely. Yeah, you, sure. I'll do it. That's right. I'll do it. No one else wanted it. I'll do it. Go ahead and pile 10 extra files on my desk. Sure. No one else will do it. I'll do it. And get paid and praise God. Oh, go home. All my stories end with eat a sandwich and shut up. Are you understanding what I'm saying? And Samuel said, Hath the Lord hath great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than that of fat of rams. Amen. And the last scripture, here's where we need to be. Amen. As I can I borrow seven more minutes, please. Is that cool? Amen. All right, so the Bible says in John chapter 21, verses 3 through 6, I want to show you something. Simon Peter saith unto them, I go fishing. I'm going to go fishing. Depending on where you live, if you're down south, from down south, you may say fixing or fin to go fishing. Amen. Peter said, I go fishing. I'm going fishing. Amen. They said unto him, we also are going to go with you. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately. And that night they caught nothing. Mm-hmm. Woo. Isn't it amazing? He made an announcement that he was going fishing, but now he had a crowd following him. This is why sometimes you recognize there's certain things you just can't do by yourself. Because people are watching you. Amen, someone. I remember saying, Lord, why can't I go through my trial privately? Why is it that everything I deal with is public? Because where you're going, there are people going as well. And here's the thing that's so amazing. They went with him, entered into the ship, and they caught nothing. So who do you think they're going to look at? Peter. They caught nothing. Who do you think they're going to look at? Peter. Are you understand what I'm saying? That's why many times I pray like, Lord, please bless the people that came to Florida with me. Because I said, I'm going to Florida. And they said, they're coming too. And there are times when we look around at each other and say, well, where's the fish? Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. I can't be real with y'all now. And that night, they caught nothing. (laughs) You'll get that later. Verse 4, look at this, look at this. But when the morning was now come, prophetically, let me just say this right here, thank you, Lord. If you can just make it through the night, throw your hands up for making it through the night. That's whatever it is you're dealing with. If you just make it, (laughs) through the night but when the morning was now come Jesus stood at the shore I don't know who I'm preaching to today but Jesus is at the shore of your heart right now Jesus stood on the shore but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus they did not even recognize him because they were so angry from the night that they wasted challenge you today don't miss Jesus because of your frustration don't not recognize Christ because of the horrible night you had last night 
don't not recognize Christ because of the horrible month you've had. Amen, someone. But recognize Christ. Amen, someone. Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew that it was, it was even Jesus. Verse 5, some good stuff here. Then Jesus said unto them, children, have you any meat? Mm. They answered him, no. This is why I thank God that I'm not preaching to a congregation that only want just a little bit. I thank God that I'm not preaching to a people of God or raising up leaders that are satisfied where they are in Christ. Amen, someone. But when Jesus shows up at the shore of your heart and asks you, is this enough? You better unequivocally answer, no, this is not. This is not enough. They answered him, no. Have you any meat? And Jesus said in verse 6, then the Lord began to deal with me because I came down here with those old ministry principles. (laughs) The way we do things up north with the F. The way we do church up north. And the Lord said to them, cast the net on the opposite side of your thought process. <laughs> you got to do one of those crazy laughs after that. And he said unto them, cast the net on the right side of the ship. On the other side of your thinking. On the side that you are afraid of. On the side that gives you the most doubt. On the side that appears to be most disrespectful to me. Is the side that I want you to learn to operate in. The side that takes me for granted. Is the side that I want you to operate in. The side that doesn't give me enough praise. Is the place I want you to learn to operate in. Not so that that way you won't give me more praise. Enough praise. I want you to give me more praise. I need to operate in that area of your life. That's disrespectful to my order. And he said it to them. Cast the net on the right side of the ship. Because to you, it's the wrong side. But to me, it's the right side. I'm not going to operate in your strengths this season. I'm not going to operate in what you know. I want to show you a new side of me. Because the old stuff that you've seen of me, because you don't use it, it's corrupted you. Let me show you a new side of me. Amen, someone. When God hid Moses in the cliff of a rock, he walked by him and showed him his glory, the hiding parts, as he passed by Moses. Moses went back to the people so much with the glow upon him, they had to put a bag over his face because he saw something new of God that he never seen. Put it on the right side. Cast the net on the right side of the ship and you shall find. One of the blessings that I've learned, we were having, I think, our first month of services, and a gentleman came to service. One of the big things we had to get over was our dress. I said, cuff link it out up north, and coming here to Florida, no cuff links. Yeah, old habits, wearing suits which will separate the people of God here. They feel like you got to dress up. Amen, someone. In order to be in. Until I prayed for this man of God. And the Lord touched him and he was blessed. And in the midst of praying for him, the Lord, (laughs) with a sense of humor, to rebuke me, to show me that the fish is on the right side of the boat, The Lord had me look down at his feet and he had on sandals. No, not sandals, flip-flops. And the man was well-to-do, but he had on flip-flops. Back in up north, that would have been unacceptable for someone to come to church in flip-flops. When Jesus Christ said, come as you are, I did not realize how religious I was until I had to pray for someone in flip-flops. I'm talking about the strap in between his toe flip-flops. Are you understanding what what I'm saying? And to me, that may seem funny to you, but it was pinnacle to me. 
It was very pivotal because it made me show the line of thinking that I was still operating in. And every new territory has a right side of the boat. And no matter where you are in life, there will be a time in your life where what you have know to do is not good enough. It's just not going to work. Turn to your neighbor and say, in this hour, it's not going to work. No, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. Coming to church once a week is not going to work. It's not going to work. Because you're dealing with a stronghold that's been generational. So you got to learn to cast on the right side of the boat. And they cast therefore. And now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fish. Jesus Christ showed them a principle in closings. He showed them a principle. That obedience is one of the greatest keys in the kingdom to obey God rather than man, rather than your logic, rather than your thought, rather than your past. Well, my past has told me, shut your past up sometimes. Sometimes your past has no lot in your future. Oh, you can learn from your past, not all the time. Are you understand what I'm saying? Amen, someone. I just keep finding bad men. And, and my past has told me, all oh, men, no, 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 no. No, if you really look at your past, you'll find that you were loose then. That's why you found men who didn't care about you. Mm-hmm. Amen. Because you didn't value yourself. So why should they value you where you haven't valued yourself? Are you, are you understand what I'm saying? So in this hour, cast your net on the right side of the boat. It goes against all your logic. And as a fisher, that goes against the rules. But because of the night that they had, (laughs) sometimes you don't even have to believe it to do it. But because of the night I had, because of the hell I've been going through, see, There are things that God will ask me to do, and I don't necessarily believe it. I do it because of what I've been through. Don't try to label me as being super deep. Amen, someone. Sometimes I'm super dumb, but smart enough to be able to say, "I because of what I've been through, I'll try it your way, Lord. He just makes me to look smart. I'm not that smart. Do you understand what I'm saying? Sometimes you just come to a place in your life where you say, okay, I'll do it your way. Because of the night I had because of the couple of months I'd have had, because of the year I had, amen, someone, because of the five years I've had, whatever the time frame is, amen, someone, because of what I've been through, I'll do it, even if I don't believe it. I'll do it because of the night I had. So God is not, amen, someone, God is not, he's not asking you, amen, someone, to believe him to do something. He's asking you to understand the urgency to do it. He said, if you don't believe me for me, believe me for the miracles. You don't have to believe me. Just do it because I said it. Because you are in need of a miracle. And instead of arguing about what you believe, just do it. Just obey. We'll work out the belief through the process. This miracle will work that belief out. You just make yourself obey. Belief will come. Prove me now. Test me now. See if I won't. Open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing you won't have room enough to receive. If you don't believe in tithing, just do it because you want to prove God. I don't believe it, but I'll do it. Prove me now. Test me. Because God knows that there are things that he's going to ask you to do that you won't believe. But, 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 but we, we stop believing. Amen. We stop doing things because we don't believe. But God is saying that there are going to be things that you don't believe. Obey because I said it. We'll work the belief out. <laughs> because through the miracle, your belief will be touched. The father said, I believe, but help my unbelief. He was saying, help my disobedience. That's exactly what he was saying. Help my ability to obey. Throw your hands up unto the Lord. Saints of God, I'm so excited for this great opportunity to share with you all right now. And I tell you, I know that the Lord is blessing and moving by his spirit all over this wonderful world while this broadcast is on. We want you to partner with us as we advance God's kingdom all for his glory. Well, until next time, 
I want you to know that the Lord loves you. Again, this has been Warren Martin Ministries, and I thank God for you watching and tuning in. God bless you. We'll see you soon.